Jewish. Wonderful. Jewish. So okay. I'm going to give a minute for people to join and come in. I know that um, a lot of folks have been waiting for this webinar to start. I'll I'll even just kind of lean into my own introduction. Um, I um, I want to welcome you. My name is Jenny Gates Beckman, and I work for the Jewish Federation of Omaha. And tonight's program, uh, we're very excited. Howard Epstein um, came to me, and I'll let him tell the rest of the story. But really, we've been working on this program for a while, and um, we're excited to present uh, the Jews, the Jews of India, and have a, um, a wonderful, warm conversation with uh, the the Abraham and Marion and their good friends, Vin and Laurel. So uh, I will give you a few um, basics about the evening and then, and then we'll start. So a reminder that um, we welcome questions. So we're gonna start off, you know, right after introductions, we'll have about 20 minutes of introductory opening um, words, and then we're going to really encourage that the rest of our time is spent answering questions. So there's a Q&A function. It's slightly different than the chat. Just pop your questions into that Q&A, and we'd be happy to work through your questions once we hit the 30-minute um, mark, and we're going to go ahead and switch over to questions. So I am very pleased to hand everything over to Howard to make our official introductions. Thanks, Jenny. <clears throat> um, I'm the executive director of the Jewish Federation of Omaha Foundation. And I first had the opportunity to talk with Vin Gupta uh, a few months back. We, um, we were fortunate enough to receive a nice uh, gift from the family of Arthur and Ann Grossman uh, for a scholarship endowment fund here at the foundation. And Vin contacted me after he learned about that. Turns out that Vin had a very close relationship with the Grossman family. When Vin came to the United States to study at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, um, his first close friend and a person that remained his very close friend throughout his lifetime was Larry Grossman, Arthur and Anne's son. And after Vin and I spoke, uh, we decided to get together and meet. And just to give you a little background on Vin and his wife, Laurel, who are here with us tonight. They're going to be introducing Abe and Miriam Sofer. We, um, we learned that, uh, of course, all of us in Omaha know quite a bit about Vin from his business, uh, which uh, was publicly traded, Info Group. Um, Vin employed over 3,000 people here in Omaha with Info Group, sold his shares in the business in 2010. And uh, Vin is now the managing general partner of Everest Group LLC, and along with his wife, Laurel, who is a native Jewish New Yorker, um, who's also a director of Everett Group, they devote themselves to philanthropy, uh, philanthropic work here in Omaha, throughout the United States, and also in the village in India where, Van, where Vin grew up. Uh, Vin's maternal great-grandfather was Jewish uh, and was from India. Okay, never mind. And um, Vin's first job out of college was with the Commodore Co Corporation here in Omaha, a mobile home manufacturing company owned by the Katzman family. I know a lot of you know the Katzmans. Uh, with the encouragement from the Katzmans and a $100 bank loan, that's a $100 bank loan, Vin started his direct mail marketing database business, which eventually became Info Group. Um, he's a longtime supporter of the Jewish Federation of Omaha, a strong supporter of Israel and Jewish people. Uh, he had the privilege of accompanying then President Bill Clinton to Israel to celebrate Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres's 90th birthday party. During our visit, Vin suggested that I contact his and Laurel's very good friends, Abe and Marianne Sofer. And here we are, a few months later, together at this presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to Vin and Laurel. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Howard. That's a great introduction. Uh, I still remember my friends Art Grossman and 
and his wife, I forgot her name. They used to live on 5809 Pine Street and their son was my best friend in college in Lincoln and we were only born about three days apart now. And he joined the State Department and he passed away a few years ago. That was a sad story. But anyway, they were like my family in Omaha. Uh, you know, I've been in Omaha now for about, or Nebraska for about 54 years. Uh, four years in Lincoln and about 50 years in Omaha. When I told my Jewish friends that my mother's grandfather was Jewish and talk about the Jewish history in India, they would just laugh at me. They would say, there are no Jews in India. You know, what are you talking about? Well, today it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the most illustrious, uh, educated and fascinating Jewish immigrant from India, that's Abe Sofer, and his lovely wife, Marian Sofer, uh, who will talk about what they have done, you know, their heritage in India and what they have done in India you know, and in Israel. But before I turn it over to Abe, I just want to say a couple of things. The Indian Army General who liberated Bangladesh, a Muslim country in 1971, he was Jewish, and most people don't know that. His name was General G.F.R. Jacob. And a Muslim country like Bangladesh gave the highest honor to a Jewish general from India, to, Mr. to General Jacobs. The second thing you may not know, or uh, I'm sure you, you might, I was reading about the history of Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa. And when he started the uh, non-cooperation movement and he wanted to set up a, a camp or ashram, the family who gave him the free land, they were Jewish family and their name was Herman Kallenbach. And they gave him free land in South Africa. That's where Mr. Gandhi set up his ashram. Can you imagine if he had not gotten the free land from a Jewish family, you know, uh, he wouldn't have gone anywhere. And Mr. Kellenbach, he was an architect and he became his lifelong supporter. So anyway, just a couple of tidbits. Now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my good friend, Abe Sofer and his wife, Marion Sofer. Abe. Thanks so much, Vin and Laurel. Thank you. And Howard, thank you for setting this up. It's really a pleasure for us to uh, talk about uh, the Jews of India. Um, and uh, I happen to have an expert on the Jews of India with me, my wife, uh, who knows, who actually knows a lot more about it and produced a book and wrote a very detailed introduction to it. And I think you have a copy of that book or uh, seen it. Um, and we, um, and she had the honor of giving that book on the synagogues of India uh, to uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, at the Israel Museum in the presence of Netanyahu. So uh, we have a real expert here in addition to <laughs> someone who just happened to be born there. So, <laughs> namely me. Now, I wanna say one thing about Vin before I, we go on. And that is that when we were in Israel together, we visited a town that was a town of Indian Jews, basically largely populated by uh, Jews from India. And they told us that the little museum they had in that town had a roof that was leaking and it needed a new roof. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, the town's called Nevatim as my, my wife points out. And um, so Vin said, let's get him a new roof. <laughs> so his charitable instincts go right, you know, go very broad. And he's been, he's been really very wonderful uh, throughout our relationship. I've, I've watched him do things like that. And we, uh, we had the fun of, of building them a new roof, which incidentally, Vin, is on some kind of a panel 
in the town. So you should go and see your name there. Uh, sure. On your roof. <laughs> so I was born in what was then Bombay, uh, now Mumbai, um, in 1938, which was just before the Second World War. So uh, actually, you should know that had I been a European Jew, I probably would be dead. Um, the, the fact is that uh, the most uh, horrendous um, set of murders in, in uh, human history occurred in those years right after I was born and no one suffered more than the European children. The, peop the children under seven the percentages of children that were killed is staggering. As it is, the percentages are staggering anyway in Poland and Holland and um, Germany. So I was fortunate to not be in the hands of the Christian folk who committed this egregious murder in Europe, but rather under the control of Hindus and Muslims who had a much better attitude toward Jews. Um, at no point in Indian history that I'm aware of have Jews been targeted. So right away, I wanna say, I've been extremely grateful for the good fortune I've had in being born in India. And and grateful to India and, and the Indian government and the values of the Indian people. Now, my community was one of several different Jewish communities in India. And I'm going to pause right now and let Marion give you a briefing on the types of Jews that uh, live in India. <laughs> All right. Well, just very quickly, um, the, there are three old communities of Jews in India. Uh, the earliest settlement was in Cochin. Now, legend uh, uh, says that even in the time of Solomon, there was a spice trade uh, to India from Israel. And that's possible. Some people point to uh, similarities in some Sanskrit words to Hebrew words like the word uh, tuku for a parrot in, in Hebrew and tokai in Sanskrit, but there's no uh, definite archaeological evidence about that. It's pretty clear though that in the time of the Roman of the uh, of the Roman uh, Empire, uh, when there was a big trade with India, it's pretty clear that there were Jewish traders there. We don't really know what kind of settlement they, there may have been uh, in terms of people permanently settled, Jews permanently settled in India, but there was big trade and uh, it's pretty clear Jews were a part of it because uh, pepper and other spices were treasured in Rome. The the cooks uh, wanted pepper desperately, and apparently you could only get it from India, from the Malabar coast. So, so uh, we see this, we see uh, the historian Pliny complaining about how much the matrons in, in Rome spent on pepper. And uh, ultimately the Romans enacted a luxury tax on the highest quality of pepper of 25%, as well as on some other luxury items. So there was a big trade. There's a third century um, guide for sailors called the Periplus, which shows the towns uh, going from the Red Sea uh, south and then across to Malabar because they, the trade winds took them uh, one way for six months, it went one way and the other six months you could come back. And um, there was, there was a very substantial trade in that period. Um, so 
there's also a tradition of uh, a, a Jewish girl greeting St. Thomas on the Malabar coast that the Christians have, the Christians in India, uh, that, that St. Thomas came and uh, there was a Jewish girl there who could, he could communicate with in Aramaic and uh, <laughs> who uh, sang some songs for him. So uh, the Christians also uh, carry this tradition of having a Jewish population uh, at that time. Uh, then we also have Marco Polo and other travelers uh, noting the Jews in Cochin. Um, there are some copper plates it's very interesting. And these copper plates, Jewish copper plates, as they're called, uh, even have their own Wikipedia page. You can look up Jewish copper plates in Cochin. And these show um, probably around the time of 900 or perhaps 1000 AD, there's been a lot of different scholarship on the dating, uh, that, a, uh, th that the local Raja or the local ruler in Malabar gave Joseph Rabban uh, an allotment of land and also certain privileges, like to use a kettle drum and a trumpet and be carried on a palanquin, a litter. <laughs> so uh, you can see all that in Wikipedia. Uh, anyway, um, the, there was a settlement uh, after the Spanish, uh, before and after the Inquisition of Spanish Jews which was uh, reinvigorated uh, few, over the next several centuries with uh, Jews from the Middle East, primarily from Baghdad and other places in Iraq, um, and also from Syria and, and uh, Lebanon. So they were mostly traders um, in the spice trade and in other trades. There's a very famous, uh, synagogue in Cochin, now called Kochi, called the Paradesi Synagogue. That means the synagogue of strangers because these Middle Easterners who came in weren't considered locals. Um, and it's a beautiful small synagogue with Chinese blue and white tile and a beautiful bima called a teba in the middle. And if you get to Southern India, you must go. Um, so uh, right now there are very few Cochini Jews left. The other, the second group, which is the biggest group is the Bnei Yisrael who were living in the Khan Khan that's south of Bombay since about at least 900 AD. Um, and there were about 25,000 uh, Bnei Yisrael B'nai Israel Jews in Bombay when India became independent. Many of them immigrated to Israel and other English speaking places, but they, they have been in, in modern times, the largest population group. They look like Indians, many of them, most of them dressed perhaps until recently like, like Indians. And they have a wonderful cuisine, which incorporates some uh, Jewish customs along with the local uh, Maharashtra cuisine. Their first synagogue was, was established before 1800. They had actually, well, their legend is that they first settled as a result of a shipwreck, seven men and seven women being shipwrecked on the Khan Khan coast. Um, and when the Cochini Jews made contact with them in, uh, I think it was the 18th or the 19th century, they had lost, they didn't have any Jewish books. They had lost a lot of uh, the customs, but were eager to uh, learn it. And uh, the Cochini Jews sent rabbis and pretty soon they were up to speed. So uh, they have a lot of synagogues starting with um, as I said, late 18th century and uh, many small, they tend to be small, small synagogues still existing in Bombay. The third group is the Baghdadis. Um, 
So they started coming when times were tough in, in Iraq at the end of the 18th, uh, 18th century. And then in, 18, in the 1830s, uh, about 30 families, Baghdadi families settled in Bombay, including David Sassoon, who had been a treasurer of Baghdad for about 15 years. Um, and then uh, he, his first wife died and the family migrated through Persia, ending up in Bombay, where he uh, set up a, a trading um, business, which became quite an empire. And you may have heard of a recent book, what's it called? The Last Kings of Shanghai? Like that, yeah, <laughs> Kings of Shanghai. Kings of Shanghai about the Sassoons. David had a lot of sons and would his, train them early in business. He himself, David, was uh, quite observant. He observed the Sabbath and uh, their businesses uh, didn't function on Saturday, Saturday and Sunday because of the uh, Christians uh, in there in Bombay. So he sent his sons to uh, different cities, London, uh, Rangoon, Shanghai. Shanghai. They had a, a big business in Shanghai. Um, they, they also developed the, the docks, the, what's called, still called the Sassoon docks uh, in Bombay. And they dealt mostly in commodities. Um, so uh, his, I think, grandson Jacob was responsible for building the beautiful synagogue where, uh, where Abe's family uh, would go growing up called Knesset Eliyahu. Um, and there was uh, another in a different neighborhood in Bombay, another Jewish, well, actually more a Muslim neighborhood, but where a lot of Jews lived also near a market. And another in the hill town called Puna. So um, the, the Bombay Jews were uh, very successful, uh, as were the B'nai Israel. They were also uh, doctors and lawyers and, and uh, excelled in the British military and the British civil service. And uh, the Baghdadi Jews uh, became highly educated and are all around the world now, a uh, few of them still in Bombay, but in uh, many in Israel and the US, uh, Toronto, Montreal, London, and so on. And uh, so I don't want to leave out that there are also some Jews in, the, in a few tribal areas, including Northeast uh, India, uh, where uh, Christians had tried to, uh, where, where there'd been some uh, Christian proselytizing, and then they found out about Judaism on a trip to Israel, and they said, wow, we, we want to do this. <laughs> One guy in particular went back and started uh, converting people. So some of those Jews have um, actually immigrated to Israel now, and you may hear or read about them as well. They're called B'nai Menashe, B'nai Ephraim, and Shavei Israel. So um, thank you, Marion. That's really, so those are the big groups. Um, and I am one of the Baghdadi uh, group. And my father's family actually didn't go to Bombay. Um, he they went to Rangoon. And my father was born in Rangoon. And you can see um, pictures on the internet of the Sofair building of Rangoon. They built a very big company in Rangoon, my grandfather and his brother, which unfortunately went bankrupt, but um, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> the Japanese would have destroyed it anyway in the Second World War. Um, but um, the Sofer family um, uh, it started in, in Rangoon and they came over to Calcutta. So um, they there was a very strong Baghdadi or Middle East, um, Iraqi Jewish contingent in Calcutta, very artistic and uh, educated. And, um, and then my father met my mother in Bombay and that was a love affair. 
um, not at all an arranged marriage. Um, and they, um, they got married in Calcutta. Actually, we last year were there and saw a picture of their wedding in, a, in one of the synagogues, one of the big Iraqi synagogues in Calcutta as a, as a Calcutta wedding, Calcutta Jewish wedding. And it was the wedding of my parents. So um, they then moved to Bombay where my father worked for E.D. Sassoon. Um, the Sassoon company hired many, many people and particularly many Iraqi Jews. And my father did well there. And he always told me, when you go to Shanghai, be sure to see the company office, be sure to see the HSBC build, uh, bank, you know, all these things. That, and we did it. We went there one day and we actually looked at all those things my father told me to look at. I lived a, a dream. Um, as growing up, I thought that my life, my, the life that I was living had existed forever. It was so organized. It was so secure and interesting. We had a nice apartment in, um, in a nice neighborhood with a big park to our left and a little bandstand to the right across the street. And then on the right was a soccer stadium and a synagogue and the Taj Mahal Hotel and the Jewish club. And the, so it was really, uh, it was really an idyllic life. We uh, went to good schools, British schools and um, played a lot of sports. You worked hard in the morning in school, but then mandatory sports in the afternoon. And then we had the, the Jewish, uh, we had the Maccabi, you know, you've heard of the Maccabi in Israel. Well, as Israel was getting going, there were a lot of Zionists, European Zionists, as well as uh, Asian Zionists would come back to India and teach us Hebrew songs, um, take us to camps where we learned about Israel. And, and, uh, and in fact, there are hardly any Jews left, certainly Iraqi Jews. There are very few Iraqi Jews in Bombay, probably fewer than 10. Every one, a lot of Jews have gone to Israel. Many came to America and many went to England and Australia, um, but many are in, in Israel. Now you may think that um, if you were to see my synagogue, You'd, you'd say, well, that's a synagogue. You know, this, it was very kind of Western because the, um, it was built by the Sassoon family and um, they were pretty European. I mean, they were the Rothschilds of the Middle East, uh, the Jewish you know, family that became extremely wealthy and later became Lord Rothschild and this and that. But basically, Lord Sassoon, Sir Sassoon, they became um, members of the House of Lords, knighted in England, as the Rothschilds did. But these were people that were really from a um, Middle Eastern culture, and they assimilated into into the Western culture. It it isn't at all alien uh, to see the synagogue that I was bar mitzvahed in, but to hear the Hebrew. And the prayers would have been would be surprising to um, Ashkenazi Jews. I married an Ashkenazi Jew, incidentally. Uh, her father is a German Jew, and her mother is a, a Litvak. Litvak. So um, the the uh, the we our Hebrew was sounded like Arabic in Bombay, um, and um, but. The difference between Ashkenazi and um, uh, Middle Eastern Jews was much less than the difference between the Middle Eastern Jews and the Bnei Israel. The Bnei Israel really had a different culture. Um, their synagogues were really different, but clearly they were Jews. You know, Shabbat and all the things that circumcision, circumcision, all the kashrut, all the things that we do. Uh, uh, in the West, and we did in Bombay, the Middle Eastern Jews did, 
They did. Uh, they're clearly Jews going back all the way to uh, Israel and the in the Roman wars. So um, that's it's. Uh, we got very involved in India. My my mother famously helped the Congress Party get Gandhi elected. You know the. There are Jews who get involved in politics and and at commerce and culture. Uh, my first cousin introduced English language theater to Bombay, and her daughter is very active producer of theater in Bombay today. Um, so it's a very dynamic group. A lot of a lot of Jews in India intermarried, and um, you will find. Uh, now, uh, Middle Eastern Jews who married Indians, and uh, you know, just as the Bnei Israel did. So, and there are still a few, a few left in India. So that's sort of a summary of the situation. We were very, very blessed to have such a lovely community in India when Israel was founded um, thanks largely to the Jews of Europe who suffered so much and built such a great country, which now, of course, all of us help um, build. Um, but then our culture, the Jewish groups in India diminished. And even the B'nai Israel are down to um, you know a couple of thousand from twenty five thousand, and the Jews of Cochin are largely gone. They're all in Israel, or virtually all of them are in Israel. So with that introduction, I think we should yeah. Tell hear me from about the letter your father received because that kind of clarifies things. The, you list your the, assets. Oh yeah, why did my why did my father leave India? Well. I hate to uh, admit it, but um, uh, I think I feel pretty much the same way that he, he did. He got a letter from the government after India declared independence saying, please list all your assets. And it was not like, a you know, tell us your income and we'll put a tax on it. They wanted to know every single thing we owned. And uh, my father, he was, you know, he came from an Arabic culture and he's not used to that kind of stuff. So uh, he, um, he said, we're moving, we're going to America. It was a great, he had already been in America and bought, he was a trader by that time and he bought stuff. In, 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 in. So that's how we moved. And I went to boarding school in England and then came here and, and um, have, have had a wonderful life and a wonderful career in this wonderful country. So fire away with questions and we'll, we'll try to make this a two-way conversation. Wonderful. Well, we already have a couple of questions in the chat or in the Q&A. And so I'll, I'll ask those now. Um, Barbara is asking, what caste did the various Jewish sects fall into and how did that play into marriage? We I'll, were I'll ask the, oh, I'm sure. going to ask the second one really quick just so you can go on to that if you'd like. The other one, Judy's asking, were there ever problems with British rule at the time you lived there? Okay, first of all, we were not in the caste system. Um, the, the, um, the Jews did not fit into the Hindu caste system. Um, so that was a relief. Um, we actually got along too well with the British um, because, especially the Iraqi Jews, because we're relatively light-skinned, um, they were willing to treat us as, as whites. There's a book called Almost Eng an Englishman <laughs> written by some... By it's Ruth Chernia. By Ruth Chernia, yeah. About, Rangoon. about the Rangoon Jews. And the Rangoon Iraqi Jews were almost Englishmen. You know that, And in fact, it became a problem 
because we were members of the British Cricket Club and this and that, tennis club and that. So uh, when independence came, um, the Indians kind of resented, well, they resented the British, of course, and the, but uh, uh, especially my group, the Iraqi Jews, we were resented because we were, we were too well uh, assimilated with the British. Um, we also have a question. Ah, do you still have family in Iraq? Uh, not in Iraq, no. Uh, I, I have no family left in Iraq. I don't think, I don't know that there are any Jews left in Iraq. There might be two or three. Uh, when I was in the State Department, I went to Iraq to negotiate the, the um, attack on the USS Stark, which was a, a guided missile attack at, that killed about 17 sailors, US sailors. And I went to Baghdad and um, at that point, there were about 50 Jews left and that was 1990. So the Jewish population of Iraq went from 25% of the population of Baghdad, well over, well, well over a quarter of a million down to 50 by the time I was there and probably now if there are two or three Jews, they're hi hiding out. <laughs> yeah. Someone All right, we have another question. So what, what was the relationship towards the Zoroastrians and other religions in India? So the, the Zoroastrians, which we call them Parsis, and Vin, Vin will know all about this as well. Um, they were an elite group very, very light skinned, uh, pale, really. They were very, they intramarried. They, they became, it became a big problem for them. Um, everybody got along with them. They were very peace loving, intellectual and commercial people. Um, and, and really a kind of a cultural elite um, and a business elite. Um, they didn't marry out. And if you did marry out, you lost your status. You know, it was very strict. I hope it's not as strict now um, for their sake. Uh, but my tutor, when I was in school, because I was a bad boy, of course, um, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of trouble to, <laughs> to raise. Our tutor, my brother and I, we had a Parsi lady in our building who was just brilliant and very kind and, and intelligent. And she, she taught us, you know, she made sure we did our homework and, and stuff like that. So they're very, very, a, a very elite and, and lovely people. Mm -hmm. Ooh, there, there are some great questions in the chat. Okay, so um, tell us more about, you did mention that there, there there was intermarriage, but has, has the, have the Jewish communities in India have to deal with the same amount of assimilation and intermarriage that American Jews experience, or was it less so? And a somewhat related question, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the practice of the Jews of India? Was it, was it were they all traditional Jews or was, was there variety? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, let's take that one at a time. The, yeah, the assimilation, Marion will talk about the, the two groups that were bigger than the uh, Iraqi Jews, clearly assimilated, right? I mean, they, it was just a matter of time. Indians are lovely people. And, and you know, the, and you, you meet, you have a boy meets a girl, a girl meets a boy, and these kind of things happen. And the, um, so the, the Jews of, of uh, Cochin, the Malabar Jews, are, look totally Indian, and the B'nai Israel totally Indian. And it, was, it would have been just a matter of time before the Iraqi Jews assimilated as well in that sense. 
uh, because you you know you it's, it's it was not a uh, it was a friendly community you, you know you you go to school with Indians and and my cousin my first cousin married a Muslim and my my um, her daughter uh, is a is a she's not a practicing Muslim but she's a Muslim uh, but actually she's Jewish because she's born she's Jewish she's, she's Jewish brought up Christian by the nanny and she was brought up Christian by the nanny okay so <laughs> there you go <laughs> so that's India for you I you think know? for everyone yeah yeah so about the the Jewish practice I see some questions about that yeah um one thing is to remember that the the Middle Eastern Jews the Mizrahi Jews and the Sephardi Jews did not embrace the harshness about Jewish practice that we've uh, seen even getting worse recently about, uh, about rules. And they were more tolerant about each other. And for instance, they would, the rule of course was not to drive or be driven to synagogue on Shabbat, but uh, if nobody complained about you, if you had, if you had driven. Um, one interesting thing is that in Bombay, the city actually made script for Jews to use on Shabbat on the buses. So it was a piece of paper and it said, uh, good for uh, transportation. Uh, and it was only only for the Jews, so they could so they wouldn't have to handle the money, and they could just hand the piece of paper, uh, or show the piece of paper uh, to the bus driver. And uh, a lot of the people who went to Abe Synagogue will tell you that uh, they would go to synagogue in the morning and in the afternoon they would go to the races. Jim Connor. <laughs> the, yeah, you, and pray. you pray to win the, the daily horses. you pray to win the daily double that day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean there was there were no such thing as uh, conservative Jews or reformed Jews. Yeah. In that sense, and when I was growing up, everyone was Orthodox, right? We and everyone was kosher. And everyone was kosher. Um, but it was it wasn't harsh. It was uh, gentle, and um, you know, if you had a kosher chicken, you knew it was a healthy chicken. It was it, there was a real value in in uh, in ha in using the kosher butcher, and we we had um, and so there was um, there was definitely all the things I've done here. I went to Yeshiva College after the Air Force. I went in the Air Force. Then I went to Yeshiva College and I was trained as a European Jew in effect at Yeshiva College because I was the only Middle Eastern Jew at that time in the college. And um, there was no, I didn't feel at all that the kids were doing anything that I was unfamiliar with. The melodies are different, but the prayers are the same. I mean, and the observe the rules came out of the Torah, you know, and, and the Torah is owned by all the Jews everywhere. So that uh, we, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a universal religion. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I'm, I'm excited about this next one. So Jews were big in the rise of yoga in the West. To your knowledge, are they connected to the Jews of India? Is there, do you know of any Jews who practiced yoga in India? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, yoga lovers include Jews. I mean, that's for sure. Um, I have, uh, I had an uncle who was in an ashram and I have a first cousin who is still alive and is at a very famous ashram uh, in Pondicherry. Uh, which is the French uh, town on the eastern coast of India. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I'm sure she practiced yoga. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's Jewish, Jewish people in, in India de definitely engaged in yoga. Now, it's a question of poor, 
it's not a poor person's uh, thing really in the West. And probably in India it is. I mean, the, the habits, the, no, the Hindus do these things, um, uh, physical things with their bodies and stuff that seems to be part of the culture. Maybe Vin could talk about that. I, I always got the impression that, that physical health was associated with yoga in the, you know, among Hindus. Interesting. Vin, did you want to say anything or no? <laughs> <laughs> yoga was just part of the culture and I, I just thought, you know, that's what it was. And, and it's something which you can do without any kind of equipment or anything. Right. So it's an easy exercise. And I think my wife knows more about it than I do. You know, so. <laughs> well, I know more about the way it's practiced in the US, which is you need the right wardrobe and studio. <laughs> so we, we, we've kind of, you know, we've kind of gotten off the path of spiritual yoga, the way they practice it in right. India. Right. That makes sense. In India. All right, we have a couple more. Um, I'll say but they're they're not related, but I'll just say both, and then you can talk for a bit. Um, were were Jews able to eat beef? Was that a problem in the Hindu environment? Um, and then, did you have any interaction with the Jews of Sudan? Hmm. So the latter question, the answer is no, not that I recall. Um, the, um, I don't recall Sudanese Jews in Bombay. I'm sure that, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some. Um, there, there were Jews from other countries who came to our synagogue. It was an Iraqi Jewish synagogue, but we had, I'm, I'm sure, I know one German Jew that came to our synagogue every Shabbat, and we, we had Jews from Turkmenistan and the Russian Eastern countries. Bukhara. Bukhara, a lot of, Bu we had Bukharan Jews. Yeah, one of, yeah. So um, yeah, but I don't remember any Sudanese Jews. Um, the first question was- About the, eating beef. About, about eating beef. Uh, you know, I don't remember eating beef. Um, chicken, chicken, chicken. I mean- And lamb. And lamb. Right, of course, lamb. Um, but I don't I mean, we had dozens of meat dishes, but they were, as far as I recall, all chicken and lamb. Wow. Um, so to shift the conversation, and maybe you want to expand upon this as much as you want, um, you've both visited Israel frequently, and, and I believe lived there for a time. Um, in your frequent trips to Israel, what are the most important things in your opinion? Where, what really, what is your hmm. hit list? <laughs> nah. Well, we, we uh, started to go to Israel because Marion's family has long been um, very engaged with Israel. Um, Teddy Kollek and Marion's father were close friends. And uh, he also knew, my Marion's dad also was a, was a aficionado of archeology. span So he got to know the archeologists at the Israel Museum and other places in Israel and visited all the sites um, often. And so he took us along uh, periodically and uh, Marion of course knew a lot more about Israel than I did when, when we met. And then I started going to Israel with her and we are in love with Israel. We, we uh, support Israel wholeheartedly. Uh, we have our differences, of course, about with some of the things that uh, Israelis do, just as we do with some of the things that Americans do. <laughs> so uh, yeah. we're... we're uh, Mentioning the theme. Uh, so we're, our main, our main charity in Israel is the Israel Museum. We have been involved with the Israel Museum for three generations. Marion's grandfather started 
supporting the Israel Museum when it wasn't built. You know, Teddy Collar came to his office and said, give me some money for the Israel Museum. So Marion actually was at the opening of the Shrine of the Book. Right. So we've been very intensely involved with, with the Israel Museum. Now, I'm all, we also support a large number of charities in Israel. I'm on the board of the Koret Foundation. And uh, last, last year, we gave $10 million to the, uh, the Museum of the Diaspora. And they built a whole new place. And we support um, all the you know, major universities to some degree or another. Um, and we support Indian- Marine, marine archeology. span Oh yeah, we, we, just did, uh, we just did a grant that brought the UCSD and the Scripps Center in San Diego together with the University of Haifa maritime uh, programs. And they are doing underwater archeology span uh, along the coast of, of Israel and this coming summer, they're going to dedicate the um, uh, diving center in Akko. That's where they actually, we, we actually visited that building before it became the diving center. It was a very uh, spare building. Garage, yeah. yeah, it was like a garage for, yeah. for boats. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're involved in a lot of things. We, I, I collected, Marion tolerated, I collected the coins of the Holy Land for something like 50 years, um, 40 years anyway. And my collection of city coins was the city coins of Israel. You know, the mainly Roman, but going back to Greek and Persian periods, and then coming forward after the Roman periods to, there were Jewish city coins and there were also, um, there were Arabic and Crusader coins and, and we gave that collection to the Israel Museum uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago. Uh, so I noticed that and we, we just uh, saw in the questions, so you visit um, our local, one of our local scholars, Rami Arav mentioned that you visited the Bethsaida uh, site with the chief curator of Israel Museum and you contributed to that expedition and the center of the Bethsaida excavations project is actually here in Omaha. So we thank you for that. Yeah, I'd forgotten that. Rami is a very, very solid scholar who has written a lot about Beit Saida and um, has, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it was wonderful. We had spent a, we spent a day with him. We spent, and we visited those sites. And my goodness, you see things that go back before the founding of Israel. You know, you see phenomenal uh, archaeology in Israel. So whenever, every summer, we try to go do some archaeology. Um, and uh, we, we're fortunate that Dick Scheuer, Marion's dad, left his apartment to Marion in Jerusalem. So we actually have a place in Israel that we go to whenever, whenever we can. We have not been there for uh, over a year. And now this summer, we're hoping that it'll be okay for us to go in June. Uh, but yeah, we, we do a lot of different things, visit wineries. Um, put the kids in camp. There. Put the kids in camp when they were young. Mm -hmm. uh, they speak oh, Hebrew wonderful. better than I do, not as well as Marion does. Um, yeah, we're we're very. Uh, oh yeah, there's the the hospitals. You know, there Israel is a small place, but it has a lot of charities. <laughs> yeah. So we have a few more questions, and I just want to be mindful of the time. We only have six more minutes. That kind of flew by. Um, so. Some, I'll go through these and then I think we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up. But, um, you know, two of these questions. One, um, are there still Jewish historical sites that can be visited in India? And I, I know based on the Synagogues of India book that there, yes, that is there. Yes, an emphatic yes, but feel free to um, tell a bit more about that. And then also, um, you know, you, you, inferred that many of the Jews of India either um, made Aliyah or moved to the US. 
So what do you really, do you, what is the future of the Jews in India? I don't think there's much of a future of the Jews in India as permanent uh, growing communities. However, uh, there are Jews in India who are going to stay in India. They love India and they, and they run the synagogues. And it's interesting that especially Israelis, they go, they love India. They go to India a lot. And yeah, isn't there a huge Seder just for the Israelis? Yeah, well, there's a Seder every year in, in Bombay for sure. And, um, and the Israelis are welcome to it. But I think it's really fair to say that my synagogue, for example, has a kosher kitchen down in the basement. And if you go to synagogue, if you go to my synagogue, which you should, it's beautiful, beautiful synagogue. It's a national monument, in, a historical monument in India. Um, you, it's right near the Taj Mahal Hotel. You can walk there from the Taj. You can go down after Friday night services. You go and have a dinner with everybody. And then Shabbat, you have lunch after this service. And the wonderful Indian Jewish Middle Eastern food. Yeah, it's really you know, good. It's kind of a mix of, of uh, tastes. The guy running the kitchen actually had, his name is Moshe Shek. His father is not Jewish, but his mother is. And he's a lovely guy who's uh, ha had a couple of very successful restaurants and sold them. And uh, luckily he's running, he's, he took over running the kitchen. And so all the visiting Jews are, are invited for the meal after the service. You can tell your friends. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny how, you know, you say to yourself, how are you gonna get a minion? But people appear. You know, uh, Bombay is a very intense commercial city. And there's a lot of people from around the world, especially Israel, yeah. who pass through Bombay. And when they pass through Bombay, they, oh, well, let's go to Knesset Eliyahu for Shabbat. And they, and they come to synagogue and you meet them there. Yeah. yeah. So I also want to say that um, the Indian government has helped restore, has restored uh, the little synagogues in uh, Cochin. So outside, out, about an hour's drive from the Paradesi synagogue, you can get to both of the restored synagogues. One's called Parur or Paravur, and the other is Chenamangalam. And it's a delightful way to go off the beaten track to get a driver to, to take you to one of these places and and I know a good driver if anybody wants the uh, name. Yeah, we can pass it <laughs> on to you. Who's also oh, a photographer. A nice young yeah. Christian man, a lovely fellow. Yeah. Um, so it was a cooperation between the state, uh, the the state archaeology department and the tourism uh, department. And I'm really hoping that tourists will find these places after COVID uh, so that the locals will see them as a resource rather than a burden. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the yeah, Indians yeah. didn't destroy our synagogues. Yeah, it's so amazing. they're there. You know, there's something like seventy synagogues in India. Something I don't yeah. know. Yeah, so, so there are quite a few functioning ones in in Bombay, of which Knesset Eliyahu I think is really the most beautiful. It was actually um, the the that restoration recent restoration was funded. Uh, by a firm which owns the building across the street. Yeah. And they have a cafe in that building. So uh, if you have lunch at the, if you have a snack there, you'll be uh, helping the, the donor to the restoration. Yeah. And they did it very faithfully with a woman uh, conservation architect and peeled away till they found the original colors and so on. So that's, that was, that's for a very nice thing also. That's incredible. Well, I'll plug your book because we do have the synagogues of in, in of India in our um, in the Kripke Jewish Library, and I would hold it up right now, but it's it it was checked out because it was out on display <laughs> trying to Beautiful. get people excited. That's there it. we go. <laughs> Beautiful. And the cover has watercolors by the author Jay Walranker. Oh, that's fantastic. And I I I want to also share that. Um, it's interesting ever since we've been
uh, passing out postcards for this, I've just heard a lot of chatter that we should, um, our community should plan a, a federation mission to India. So I- That's right. There, there's a woman who, who uh, from Calcutta, whose father was the rabbi in Calcutta and then in Philadelphia, Rachel Muslia. M-U-S-L-E-A-A. -A. We'll, we'll send you her contact yeah. information. And she She's has tours. Really wonderful lady, very intelligent and very nice. And she knows everything. And she can really show the Federation group, uh, the, you know, India and all That's the Jewish India, especially Jewish India. And um, let us know when you're going so we can meet you, uh, meet <laughs> up with you. <laughs> we will do that for certain. Thank you so much, all of you. I just want to wrap us up and remind everyone that this program was a partnership between the Jewish Federation of Omaha and the Jewish Federation of Omaha Foundation. And we are funded um, by the Philip and Ethel Kletznik Chair in Jewish Civilization. And um, we really, like this has been an utter pleasure. I think we could have done a whole additional hour with all of you. And I, I thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, we, we loved it. Thank you thank so you. much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Vin. Thank you, Abe. Thank you, Maria. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I learned so much that I didn't know about you. I thought I knew everything, but well, you enlightened us. Okay. Good. It's your turn next. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. Good night. Good night.